It is now time for a question period. The member from Barrie. Here we go. Thank you, Speaker. New billion dollar Speaker, scandal. My question is uh, to the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games. I'll maybe give him a moment to uh, get to his seat. Oh, yeah. Speaker. Minister, since 2011, we've been asking what the Pan Am Games will cost the province. For two years now, we've insisted the budget of $1.4 billion wasn't the real budget. You've insisted it was. Other Pan Am projects, like the Athletes' Village, $709 million, the Pan Am Trails, $3.5 million, ARL at $456 million, the transportation between uh, up to $90 million, the Pan Am Secretariat at another $10 million, were not included in your $1.4 billion pretend budget. After two years of demanding the truth, holding your feet to the fire, you're back against the wall. Today we received an estimate that is almost more than double the cost Whoa. of the $1.4 billion and over $2.5 billion. $3 billion. Minister, and you still refuse to release the exact number for the games. Why do you think it's acceptable Thank to you. play games with the Ontario taxpayers' money? Not acceptable. <laughs> Minister responsible for the Pan Am game. Thank you, thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, this morning we had a technical briefing, and uh, the opposition was invited, but uh, he chose not to get there. So, so uh, he, he will keep his unfounded allegation, and he keep himself. Uh, the tradition of this place is not to mention anyone's uh, pre uh, attendance in this place, and I would ask the member not to do it again. Finish, please. Uh, I will. Uh, I will wait for calm. Finish, please. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we have been upfront, open, and transparent on the Pan and Para Pan American game. For example, Speaker, one of the largest items in our additional investment is the Avalis Village at 700 million. That makes up 70 percent of the one billion. The Avalis village has always been the responsibility of the whole steward section and outside the 1.4 operating 1.4 billion operating budget. From the very beginning, Speaker, in the bid book to report in both in the Toronto Star and Toronto Sun in 2009. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, Minister, I would have been proud and uh, pleased to come to your technical briefing had I been invited. Here. Minister, uh, this has been kind of tiring and really, frankly, kind of sad. From the start, you've done everything you can to stymie us on finding out the true cost of the Pan Am Games at every stop. The list is long, Minister, from hidden budgets to FOI requests costing more than $3,000 to refusing to answer questions in question period, we just witnessed that, to blocking investigation of the Games and Committee, sacrificing worthy bills like Bill 105, you're determined to hide the true cost of the Pan Am Games to the public. You've even resorted to having us sift through 45 boxes of 50,000 documents since you won't just show up, open up to the people of Ontario. Today, because we have your back against the wall and because you know we have the information buried in those documents, we found out that your budget is over $2.56 billion, wow. way more than the $1.4 billion you've been touting for the past Answer. three years. Minister, are these the actions to be indicative of what an Ontario can expect from the supposedly new and open and transparent, responsible government? Well, that's the very sad. Please. Thank you. Minister. Speaker, thank you, Speaker. Through you to the member opposite. He was invited. He failed to show up. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, stop the clock, please. Uh, while, while that is not exactly uh, talking about somebody's attendance, it's tiptoeing around that fact, so I'd ask the member to be very cautious of making any references whatsoever. Thank you very much. Speaker, I was invited two times to debate on the light show. They, the opposite, failed to show up. I show up. Speaker, allow me to continue the Avalix Village. It is a cornerstone. It is a cornerstone of the broader revitalization of the West Townlands into a vibrant new mixed-use community. Speaker, 
that will boast over 250 units for low-income rental, over 100 units for affordable housing sales, the first ever George Brown residence that will house 500 students, a brand new YMCA. The revitalization has been planned since 1980. It's almost 30 years. Speaker, thank you. Thank you. We're going to offer some clarity here, and I think it's important uh, because the debate needs to take place. Any reference to attendance in this House or uh, requirement is conventionally not mentioned, and we all know why that convention is important to stick to. There's a, a tightrope walk between briefings that are not part of the House and late shows or attendance in the House that isn't. I will listen very carefully to ensure I make the distinction between the two. And as for the comments that I'm hearing, I'm also hearing some heckling on both sides that is borderline unacceptable in the parliamentary. So I'm going to ask everyone to just bring it down, get to the crux of the issue, question, answer. We'll leave it at that. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, we don't trust you. I don't think the people of Ontario trust you either. Your government's been talking a lot about transparency and accountability. The Premier even went so far as to stand up and promise Ontario that this, gov this government is committed to this, or at least simply having a conversation about it. Yet to date, openness and transparency have been non-existent when it comes to the Pan Am Games, and the commitment you've shown to doing the exact opposite is astounding, Minister. We've asked simple questions, and in return we've received convoluted answers from a confused minister. Today, today the estimates confirm that the games will likely cost more than double the $1.4 billion budget that you've been talking to us Unbelievable. about. Unbelievable. Minister, you've lost control of the games, the trust dollars. of the province. Maybe you should just simply show up for work and res or resign today. Here, here. Someone else do who can handle the job. You see the please? You see the please? Minister? Speaker, I don't trust his words. Yeah. <laughs> Speaker, the member and the party opposite have never had anything say positive about the Pan Am Games. In fact, they continue to shine a negative light on our local Pan American communities, our competing athletes and para athletes, over 20,000 volunteers, over 26 new capital and infrastructure projects, and the 250,000 tourists that will be visiting. The part that the party also continue to cut ties and embarrass our promise with 41 nations, boycotting our reception last month and spreading unfounded allegations and numbers to the public. We are planning for the best ever game. Speaker, the most open and transparent game ever. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. Can you see it, please? Can you see it, please? No question, the member from Perth, Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Pre the Premier came to Wellington County on October the 11th for her announcement. Of the Bush environment Bush. come to order. She was asked about the Liberal NDP decision to pull the plug on SARP, oh. which they did with no warning to the industry they were about to devastate. Mm -hmm. On CBC French Radio, the Premier admitted the decision, and I quote, was not a good decision. The yeah. Premier was at the Funny. cabinet table when that decision was made, but she didn't speak up. No, yeah. she did not. The leader of the NDP also had a chance to speak up, but she chose not to. Speaker, my, here is my question. When will the Premier ask the NDP to join her in apologizing for what she has already admitted here, here. Not a good decision? Here, here. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
We cancelled the uh, slots at racetrack program because of problems around transparency, Mr. Speaker, and accountability of the program. There were three reports: the Sadinsky report, the Drummond report, and our transition panel, Mr. Speaker, who identified problems with the slots at racetrack program. What I have said is that in the cancellation of the program, there was not due consideration for the impact, and so that is why we put the transition panel in place, Mr. Speaker. That is why we have developed a new program, Mr. Speaker, that's a five-year commitment to invest $400 million to put the horse racing industry on a sustainable path, Mr. Speaker. I've been very clear that I want, that I want us to have a sustainable horse racing industry in Ontario. My predecessor, the Minister of Agriculture, uh, Minister of uh, Community and Social Services, when he was Ag Minister, he put in place the transition panel. We are following those recommendations, Mr. Speaker. So I have been consistent in my message. We could not leave the SAR program in place. Thank it was you. not Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Sad. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have already shown just how little they care for horse racing right. when they cut them off the knees at, in 2012. Sad. The industry knows that, but they also know that Andrea Horvath and the NDP let this happen. Yeah. They could have said no, but they sacrificed the industry for a few budget trinkets. They could have said no, but they said yes to save their political hides. My question to the Premier. Could she inform the House which party and which leader were the only ones to take a principal stand against the Premier's not a good decision to right kill here. the horse racing industry in 2000? Before we move forward, I'll remind all members that we refer to each other in this place either by their title or their riding. I don't want to hear it again. Yes, some, some people are. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I just, I, I'm going to uh, respond to the part of the question that, uh, that seemed to imply that we don't have a plan in place that's going to work, and I'm going to quote from some of the people who actually know what's going on, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to quote from the Senator Wellington Mayor, Joanne ross -Zuch, Mr. Speaker. She said, for Senator Wellington, this is really good news, and this is the, on the, uh, at the time of the announcement of the five-year uh, plan. For Senator Wellington, this is really good news. Our agricultural industry has actually been boosted by this announcement. Wynn has given five years, and there's going to be an investment to make this industry Member from productive Huron and sustainable. Bruce, come to order. It now puts people back to work. From this day forward, it is getting back into this working relationship we've had with the OLG and the racing industry, and now the community to get back on track to plan for the future. This is very good news. Paul Walker, president of the Grand River Agricultural Society. It's building Answer. a solid foundation for horse racing and moving forward. They've put a lot of thought and work into this. The biggest part is the integration into the gaming industry. Without it, I don't think any Thank of you. it would work. Thank you. Before we go to the supplementary, I'm going to ask the Minister of Rural Affairs to come to order. Thank you, Speaker. Only one party has consistently shown support for the industry. Only one right party can created SARP, which led to the unprecedented success in thousands of jobs. Right. Only one party stood against the 2012 Liberal NDP budget. Only one party has produced a bold but an achievable five-point plan to put the industry back on track. That's Tim Hudak of the Ontario PCs. But, Mr. Speaker, the industry needs more than a meaningless gimmicky motion from the NDP, a motion to restore what they themselves allowed to collapse. We need real action from a team with real credibility on the horse racing pile. That's what we're offering. When will you get on board with our plan? Thank you. Thank you. Premier. 
Much, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, the party opposite put in place a program that we have three reports that have, have made it clear that the SAR program was unaccountable, it was not transparent, and it was bad public policy, Mr. Speaker. So I have some more quotes from uh, reactions to uh, the announcement of the, the five-year partnership plan that we put in place. Dr. Ted Clark, the Grand River Raceway General Manager. It's remarkably better than what our outlook was a year ago today. We essentially went from a place of having no relationship with government and no support to a place where we now have a spot to make a plan. This provides a new set of building blocks to move forward. We've been given some tools with which to work, and hopefully we can put them to good work. Uh, Alex Lark from the Rideau Carlton Raceway. Uh, I feel very optimistic, though. It's not what we had before. Pro it definitely will sustain racing at Rideau and provide our patrons and the horsemen the critical Answer. mass that's required to maintain a program. Uh, and Brian Tropia from the Ontario Horse Harness Horse Association. The hard work happens now. Thank you know, you. if we, you really truly believe this is going to sustain the. Thank you. Your question, the leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This fall, the Legislature passed uh, legislation to hire a financial accountability officer, and the government said they plan to have that office up and running by the new year. Does the Premier still intend on in, in meeting that goal, Speaker? Premier. Thanks. Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, it's critically important that we do have that financial accountability officer in place. Uh, we have established a, a committee by members of the opposition to select that accountability officer. We await, as I, as the finance minister, uh, I'm awaiting anxiously the work uh, that that committee to, is to be done by yourselves, uh, by the members of both parties, including you, Mr. Speaker. So it's up to uh, the, this House to bring forward the candidates, and uh, and then we'll move. And I'm, I, I wait with, uh, with bated breath. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, over a month ago, the Speaker um, asked uh, each party to name an MPP to the All Party Hiring Committee. Why hasn't the government submitted their name, Speaker? Minister of Finance. The House Leader, Mr. Speaker. My House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, there is a process in place uh, by which uh, a panel is put together, and I, I know we've discussed this at House Leaders' meetings. And. Uh, Parties are coming forward with their names, and we'll get the panel in place, and they will go through the usual process to choose a, uh, a parliamentary officer. Final supplementary. Yeah, well, Speaker, the government said they plan to have this office up and running by the end of this year, but with a month to go until Christmas, they haven't even struck the hiring committee. New Democrats indicated weeks ago that we are ready to get to work. We've named our member for the committee, Speaker. When will the Premier stop stalling and appoint a member to the hiring committee? Mr. Speaker, a member is playing games. Uh, she knows there's a process in place by which uh, we work with uh, the clerk and we work with you to get a panel that is put together. That panel, in turn, advertises for the position. There's an interview process. It is the usual process that's followed for the hiring of a, uh, of a parliamentary officer, and uh, I expect that it will move forward very quickly with uh, uh, the selection of that individual through the usual process. No question. Later the third part. The next question is for the Premier. The Financial Accountability Office was designed to stop spending scandals before they happen and to give people, the people of this province, real insight into Ontario's plans when they plan new programs. Now, it was supported by all parties. It's supposed to be in place this year. But once again, we hear a lot of Liberal talk and see no action. Will the Premier submit her name to the hiring committee today and get this process, as was so adequately described by her House Leader, up and running so we can get that office in place. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, and the process was adequately described by the uh, government House Leader, and we are going to take part, Mr. Speaker. The name will be submitted, and we will move ahead. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm not exactly sure what the problem the, uh, the leader of the third party is identifying, but I asked about this the other day. I know that a name, uh, I know that a person has been identified, and that name will be submitted, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. People are really tired, Speaker, of seeing a government that can't seem to respect the value of public dollars, and they find it increasingly tough to trust a Liberal government that cannot deliver on a simple 
basic commitment speaker. The Premier agreed to, to create the Financial Accountability Office, but now she's playing politics and holding up the actual creation of that office because she's not naming the Liberal member for the office, and frankly, neither have the Conservatives named their number, member for the office. Why can't the Premier simply take a small step and provide a name today so that we can actually get to work on this office? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I believe that the leader of the third party knows full well that this item is on the agenda for House leaders tomorrow, that it is going to be discussed, Mr. Speaker. We are fully compliant. We are going to be submitting a name, Mr. Speaker. We want this to go forward. So again, I have no idea what the leader of the third party is going on about, Mr. Speaker. We are taking part. We know that it's important. We want the financial accountability officer in place. We'll be submitting a name. My hope is that the uh, opposition will be submitting a name as well, Mr. Speaker and the process will go forward. Thank you. Final supplementary. The clocks are ticking. Your letter was dated October 7th, and these two parties still have not named their member. This government seems to prefer hiding behind conversation uh, be instead of delivering results. We see it all the time, Speaker. Instead of keeping a commitment to close corporate tax loopholes, they talked about closing them, and then they kept them open. Instead of moving on a plan to cap CEO salaries, they talked about capping them and let the paychecks keep growing. Instead of making sure Ontarians have a financial accountability office to help stop waste before it starts, the government continues to play games. Why should the people of this province believe the Premier has plans to tackle waste and put people first if she can't even keep a basic commitment like having that financial accountability office up and running by the end of this year, which was a commitment Question. that they made? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, as I said in my previous answer, uh, I think the leader of the third party knows that this agenda, this item is on the agenda for House leaders tomorrow. The PA to the finance minister is going to be our member, Mr. Speaker. That is the member that we're putting forward. We know who we're putting forward, and that name will be given tomorrow. So that work has been done. It has been done, Mr. Speaker. So I, I guess I would just like to say that this is a process question. It's very important. We are we are in process, and we are working with the uh, the other parties. Mr. Speaker, we would love to have the support of the uh, the third party in getting Bill 105, the Small Businesses Act, passed. Mr. Speaker, that's a substantive piece of work that needs to happen. It needs to be done by the end of the year. So my hope is that the leader of the uh, third party will work with her members and we'll Answer. have the support of that party because 60,000 businesses in the province will benefit from that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Premier this morning. Premier, a lot's happened over the last week or so, and some of it's gone unnoticed. So let me bring you up to speed. The latest Ontario job numbers came out, and they show that we've lost almost 40,000 jobs in October, 16,000 more in the manufacturing sector in October. We got the devastating news that Heinz is closing after 104 years in operation in Leamington, throwing almost 800 people out of work and thousands more possibly in spin-off jobs and in the supplier sector. A wind power company that your government promised would be able to set up inefficient intermittent wind turbines is now been given the green light so that it can sue the Ontario taxpayers for a decision that you made. The OPP has cranked up its criminal Russian. investigation into the $1.1 billion scandal in your office and a lot of other stuff too. Premier, considering the mess that we're in, when are you going to admit that you're not up to Thank this you. job? Oh. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. <laughs> Thank you very Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I appreciate the very diffuse question from the, uh, the member opposite, but Mr. Speaker, I am focused on making the investments in people and the investments in infrastructure and the investments in a, a dynamic and innovative business climate that is going to allow this province to move to a future that's aspirational, Mr. Speaker. I am 
understand that the, the role of the opposition is to oppose. But, Mr. Speaker, I also believe that it is the role of the opposition parties to work, in, particularly in a minority parliament, to work with government, to work together so that we can work it together in the best interest of the people of the province. For example, Mr. Speaker, we have a piece of legislation, Bill 105, on the books that needs to be passed by the end of the year. 60,000 businesses Answer. will benefit, Mr. Speaker, small businesses. We would really like to see that the Conservative Party that apparently supports business might work with Thank us you. so we can create those jobs, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Premier, what we did learn from you last week was that you like to run. You, you, you're better at running away from the province's problems than you are at running the province of Ontario. You know, if you spend a little more time dealing with the job that needs to be done instead of lacing up your sneakers, maybe the province that you lead wouldn't be on the road to ruin. Our debt has doubled under your government. Our deficit is at record levels. And the finance minister himself has said numerous times that balancing the books, well, that's not even really a priority for him. News released yesterday shows that the Bank of Canada may double our interest rates. That could cost us billions more dollars. You are irresponsible with Heinz. Now thousands of Ontarians in the Leamington area are going to be out of work. How many more Ontarians are going to have to lose their jobs before you change course? Or are you just content to see the province that was once the leader in Confederation hit rock bottom? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, you know, I, I really time. believe, and we believe on this side of the House, that Ontario has a very bright future. And in order for us to realize that future, Mr. Speaker, it is extremely important that our excellent education system remain excellent, Mr. Speaker, and go to the next level. It is extremely important that our health care system that is dealing with a, a demographic Order. that is going to be challenging for the whole of the Western world, Mr. Speaker, that our health care system is sustainable and that we transform it in ways that people get the services that they need, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. I believe that it is extremely important that we recognize the infrastructure challenges that are facing us as a country, Mr. Speaker, and as a province, that we invest in transit, that we invest in the roads and bridges in northern Ontario and in rural Ontario that's going to allow yes, those communities to expand and thrive. That is the focus that we have, Mr. Speaker. That is the aspirational future we see for the province. I'm sorry that the opposition doesn't share that with us, Mr. Speaker. If they did, we could do wonderful things for them. Please. You say it, please. New question, the member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've got a question for the Minister of Health. When our loved ones go into a long-term care home, they deserve to know that they will be safe, comfortable, treated with respect and dignity. One of the ways to ensure that our loved ones receive the right care is an ironclad system of inspection and follow-up on incidents and deaths in long-term care. Until recently, the coroner's office investigated every 10th death in the long-term care homes, but now this level of oversight has been cut, while at the same time, W5 exposed 61 residents-on-residents -residence murders and tens of thousands of cases of violence. When is this government going to take violence into our long-term care homes seriously and provide the proper oversight? Thank you. Minister of, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, speaker, I can, uh, I, I can assure the member opposite, as I have on many occasions, that we take the safety of our patients, the residents in long-term care homes, extremely seriously. And we take the, the safety of our uh, of, of the workers, uh, Speaker, in those homes extremely seriously. We have passed legislation uh, to allow for stronger enforcement, better inspections uh, of Ontario's long-term care homes, and sadly, neither opposition party actually supported that legislation. The coroner um, has recognized that we do have stronger oversight now than we did before. The homes have to develop and Im implement a policy to protect zero tolerance of abuse and, uh, and neglect. They have a duty to protect residents from abuse and to ensure that residents Answer. are not neglected. It is mandatory to report abuse. Speaker, we take this as a very serious responsibility. Thank you. 
Supplementary. Speaker, last week I wrote to the Ombudsman to ask his office to investigate whether the ministry was following up on its own investigations and orders to long-term care homes shortly before Mr. Francisco de Silva was killed at the Castle View Witchwood Tower, the ministry had, had inspected the home and issued 10 orders that would have improved the conditions in the home. When the ministry, ministry issue orders, people need to have confidence that someone is checking to make sure that those orders are complied with and that the problems get fixed. Did the minister ever follow up on those orders to ensure that they were being enforced? Minister. Uh, speaker, I can, uh, I can speak to the improvements in the inspections and the follow-up since we took office. When we were elected in 2003, there were 59 inspectors working for the ministry. We now have over 140, and we are uh, continuing to recruit new inspectors to add to that speaker. Uh, we've, we've hired 64 new inspectors since September of this year, Speaker. Last year, the ministry conducted uh, almost 2,400 2, inspections. That's, uh, homes are inspected on average 3.7 times per year. Uh, speaker, we've, uh, we are working very hard to improve the quality of care, and we are not going to stop improving, Speaker, because we're committed to making sure that everyone who comes into a long-term yes, care is, has the confidence that they will get the best possible care, Speaker. Thank you. New question. Person, uh, your sole question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister responsible for senior affairs. Mr. Speaker, the Minister recently joined the Premier and the Minister of Government Services in Waterloo for a very important announcement, the introduction of a new seniors grant program. Mr. Speaker, this very significant announcement has been extremely well received by constituents across the province, especially the seniors in my riding of York Southwestern. Mr. Speaker, my office has already received numerous phone calls from local senior groups expressing their interest and gratitude for this government's commitment to the seniors of this province. Mr. Speaker, would the minister please inform the House on how this new grant program will improve the lives of seniors in Ontario? The minister responsible for senior affairs. Thank you very much, Speaker. I want to thank the uh, remarkable member from York Southwestern for her tireless effort in advocating for seniors in her riding. Speaker, indeed, I'm very proud to inform the House that following the uh, recent economic statement, our government has introduced yet another first in Ontario's history, a grant program specifically dedicated to seniors. Speaker, is that our government commitment to provide more seniors across our province with the support they need to lead active, engaged life through a new seniors community grant program. With this grant, uh, uh, we continue, Speaker, to build upon the success of Ontario's action plan for seniors. And, Speaker, it is extremely important to me, as Minister responsible for seniors affairs, the government, and I believe every member yes, of sir. the House, Speaker, to continue our strongest effort to provide uh, our seniors uh, making this province the best province to age in. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. Let me say that the seniors in my riding of York Southwestern appreciate a government that recognizes the important contributions that seniors have made and continue to make in shaping our great province. And they are excited, very excited to have a minister with, it, with the sole responsibility to advocate on their behalf and to have the opportunity to receive support from the first grant program in Ontario dedicated solely to supporting seniors. I especially know that some local seniors groups in my riding, like the Golden Age St. Fidelis Club, the Pelmo Park Seniors, will appreciate a grant program aimed at assisting seniors community groups. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us more about this grant program? Thank you, Minister. Um, thank you again, uh, Speaker, to you and to the member as well. Uh, the uh, grant aims uh, to help seniors groups of all sizes. <clears throat> and I'm proud to say, Speaker, that the grant will better allow our seniors to connect within their own communities. The grant provides funding to not-for-profit groups and organizations for projects that encourage great social inclusion, volunteers, minimize isolation, encourage participation, 
and community engagement for seniors across our province. Speaker, the grant ranges from $500 to $10,000 to help support initiatives that will allow seniors to con contribute to all aspects of a community life, and that is aimed at non-profit group uh, seniors. Answer. Again, uh, let me say, Speaker, that the uh, seniors built our province, and it is uh, most important that we provide them the, uh, all the uh, investment that they need to continue to live thank an active you. and connected life in their communities. Thank speaker. you. And I thank you. Question the member from Melbourne, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of the Pan Am Games. Minister, yesterday we had a late show sitting following my dissatisfaction with your answer to the question I asked the, regarding the Pan Am Games transit plans budget. All I've been looking for was a simple answer. A ballpark figure, at the very least, of how much the taxpayer will fork over for the Pan Am Games transit plan. I do not think that that was an unreasonable request. So you rose yesterday and talked about the cost of the Athletes' Village and expansion of Ontario's trail networks, but again made no mention of any costs associated with the, tra the transit plan. Minister, the Games are less than two years away. Can you tell me right now, what is the budget for the Pan Am Games transit plan? Thank you, Minister responsible for the Pan Am Games. Thank you, Speaker. I believe the uh, member opposite had uh, uh, Minister Murray and his deputy for answering these questions in estimate committee yesterday or day before. Speaker, it's truly really unfortunate that he cannot comprehend the fact that where we are in the planning stages now is completely normal. The transportation costs are continuously evolving. We have a game food playing that is over. 10,000 kilometer square. Order. We are working with the to coordinate and come to agreement with the game are an unprecedented event Order. in our province, and we have never experienced anything on this scale. Speaker, it cannot be compared to your business plan, which you cannot understand, and we will not acknowledge those facts. Then I really feel sorry for you. Thank, Thank you. you, Speaker. Thank, thank you, Speaker. Minister, what I can't comprehend right now is the fact that the Minister of Transportation announced the budget in Estimates Committee, yet at 6 o'clock, after the Ministry announced the $70 to $90 million budget, you still could not answer the question of how much was in the budget. I find the lack of communication, Mr. Speaker, between the two ministries on this multi-million dollar project very disturbing. Minister, throughout this Pan Am fiasco, you've overseen cost overruns, secret budgets, and a well-paid executive team that nickels and dimes the taxpayers by expensing for coffee and donuts. So it doesn't surprise me when you said yesterday that the opposition's line of questioning on the matter was ignorant, disrespectful, and damaging. Well, as a member of the only party here that stands up for the taxpayer, I find your aversion to transparency ignorant, disrespectful, and damaging. Minister, will you apologize to the constituents of my riding and all Ontarians for your complete mismanagement of this file? Senator, please. Senator, please. Thank you. Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I knew the uh, party opposite had a reading problem. We now know they have a comprehension deficit. Oh! Mr. Speaker, they asked for the information. The member for Barry got it. I went out of my way. We, I, my office personally phoned him, as did Minister Chan, to offer him technical briefing. We've kept you in the loop. What's it? You know, Mr. Speaker, I was the host mayor of the last Pan Am Games. In Manitoba, people were excited. You have been an embarrassment to the people of Ontario. You have shamed us in front of the world. You protest like children in front of international conferences. You are diminishing the work of volunteers. You are diminishing the work of athletes. You are shameful in your partisan ignorance you brought to it. You don't even understand. Seated, please. You see it, please.
All right, now I'll name. Ooh, nice and quiet. New question. The member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question to, is to the Minister of Tourism, Sport, Culture, Pan Parapan Games. Speaker, it seems that this government is making a habit about playing cute when it comes to the real costs of the games. Today, there are questions about a ballpark figure for the estimated total costs of the games, and we are yet again being stonewalled by the government. Even more concerning, Speaker, is that Ontario is the guarantor for any deficits, but the government still can't tell us what the total price tag for the games will be. Speaker, will this minister the tell Ontario when come he will stop order. playing games when it comes to the cost of the Pan Am Games? Thank you. Minister responsible for the Pan Am Pan Am Games. Thank you, thank you, Speaker. As I said before, uh, this morning we had a technical briefing and uh, we offered to the press and also offered to uh, the opposition critic here. Speaker, we are very clear in terms of the budget of the Pan Am Games. Uh, Ontario contributed $500 million into the 2015 uh, uh, Operating Committee, and the federal government as well contributed $500 million, and the rest, about $400 million, contributed by local governments and also donors and also the revenue from, uh, from tickets. On top of that, uh, Speaker, we also uh, build a village, which is $700 million. This is outside the 1.4. And uh, this is a project. This is 20 years in the running. Uh, the athletic village will revitalize the West Don land. It will create a vibrant community. 500 George Fund residents will be there, and also a YMCA operating there. And also, it will provide uh, affordable housing for the less fortunate. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, it appears we have confusion as a new sport. Speaker, uh, there seems to be a theme with this government's inability to come clean when it comes to costs. Today, we heard the government is likely recouping 65 million of the 700 million invested in the athletes' village. But again, we don't have confirmation. Ontarians want to be assured that the games are going to come in on budget, as they keep saying. And the best way to do this is by being to lay out the costs in plain figures. Speaker. When will this minister and this government commit to providing all the numbers and stop playing these games? Minister? Speaker, I just mentioned about the public village. I think uh, it's clear to the, to the uh, member opposite. Now, Speaker, let me talk about the, uh, the uh, success of the game and also hosting the game, the benefit of having the game here. Hosting the game, Speaker, will trigger investment in new and existing sport and recreation infrastructure. All right. Create a legacy fund to support the operation of facility post games. Create 26,000 new jobs, 15,000 jobs directly related to the game investment. Speaker and other 11,000 plus are projected as a result of the games related investment and tourism. Speaker, it will attract 250,000 visitors, Amazing. bring 10,000 athletes and team officials to Ontario. Speaker, it will build and train a team of approximately 20,000 volunteers. Answer. Speaker, I am excited to be a part of that. So to answer your question that I will not, I will be enjoying the game. Thank you. Thank you. The question, the member from Thorgo Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Attorney General, it is my understanding that last week you attended the Federal Provincial Territorial Meeting where Ministers of Justice and Public Safety from across the country meet to discuss, first nation, to, to discuss nationwide priorities. Access to justice is a big concern for the people of my riding of Scarborough Guildwood. So I'm pleased to know that the Ontario discussion also included these initiatives to build a strong, more accessible justice system. Mr. Speaker, could the Attorney General please tell this House about the important provincial justice issues he raised on behalf of all Ontarians? Thank you, Attorney General. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the uh, member for this uh, question. Yes, last week, uh, Minister Mayor and myself. That's what I said. I'd like to thank her for the, for the question. Uh, Last week, uh, the, uh, Minister uh, Mayor and myself attended the uh, Federal Provincial Territorial Ministers of Justice meeting in Whitehorse, and there were a number of issues that were discussed with uh, other ministers from other provinces and territories as well. Uh, one of the uh, key initiatives that we highlighted 
was the uh, improving of our justice system with the uh, setting up the, uh, the new Aboriginal representation on our jury role system, which is very important, particularly to the Aboriginal community. One of the other issues that we discussed, Speaker, was the funding of legal aid. You may recall that in our budget, we are uh, supplying an extra $30 million for legal aid around uh, the province, wow. particularly for uh, clinics and for family health uh, in family health. It's interesting to note that the system used to be uh, at one time a 50-50 proposition between the federal government and the provincial government. Right now, Ontario spends about 80 percent of wow. the Thank legal you. aid money, and so we urge the federal government to come up Thank with you. its other 30 percent that's required in order to Thank you. Back. Supplementary. I thank the Attorney General for that answer. It is good to hear that this government is helping those in the justice system who need it most. My community of Scarborough Guildwood has one of the largest off-reserve Aboriginal populations in the province, and I know they would be pleased to hear your initiative to increase Aboriginal representation in the jury system. But this brings me to my next point. The off-reserve Aboriginal communities in my riding continue to express significant concern about the inadequate and unsustainable resources for First Nations police services and communities. While the First Nations policing program agreements were signed this year, First Nations communities and policing leaders expect significant enhancements in subsequent agreements. Despite the operational pressures and the increase in office workload and community populations, the full-time equivalent complement in any of Ontario's First Nations policing agreements has not Question. increased since 2006. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Attorney General, what was the message that this government delivered at the fe federal, provincial, territorial meeting regarding First Nations policing. Attorney General. I'll refer this to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister. Yes, I want to thank uh, the member from uh, Scarborough Gilwood for this question. Yes, I made it very clear at the meeting that First Nation policing, policing need to be addressed. Ontario is very supportive of First Nation uh, policing, but the federal uh, government approach has to change. The federal government will not increase uh, the budget until March 31, 2014, and there is more problem. They have a retention problem, they have a housing problem, they have a network order. Member from Timmins, James Bay, problem, come to order. almost non-existent in First Nation community. So I have called on the federal government to address it. They have uh, uh, eliminated the police officer recruitment fund, and the province invested $4 million to make sure that these uh, police officers will Thank remain you. in the First Nation community. Thank you. Thank New you. question, the member from Leeds Grenville. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games. Minister, I'm not that? sure if you played sports, but I want to try to explain something to you. Before you play the game, you need to know and have some rules. Otherwise, you have people running around not knowing what to do, which pretty well describes mayhem, which is how you've uh, handled the Pan Am game so far. It's really shameful, but it's really no surprise to learn that the budget is now over $2 billion. That's what happens, Minister, when you have no rules and no plan. Minister, you wouldn't run a peewee hockey practice without any rules. Why do you think it's acceptable to do so for a $2 billion international sporting event like the Pan Am Games? Seated, please. Seated, please. Minister. Speaker, another ridiculous rubbish allegation. <laughs> Let me be clear one more time about those numbers. Yes, Speaker, funding the Avlis Village has always been clear as part of the Ontario's host jurisdiction responsibilities and budget. It was stated in 2009 before the Durham, outside come to order. 2015 Games budget of $1.4 billion. It was announced again April 26, 2009 by former Minister George Clifferman when the site was unveiled at the West Thornland. Speaker, and as recent as our 2013 budget, it was reaffirmed that the Avlis Village is separate from the our 500 million Answer. contribution to the organizing committee's budget. Yeah. Speaker, the investment of the Pan Am Public Fitch have been in plain sight for over Thank four you. years. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Perfect. Appreciate it, please. 
Be seated, please. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thanks, Speaker. Back to the minister. I guess I learned something today. He's a pretty good dodgeball player. Spent two years evading our basic questions, like what it's going to cost to provide security for these games. Now we know why. The budget is completely out of control. It's more than double the $1.4 billion you've been telling us, and we're still counting. This is no longer about you and mismanagement. It's clear that you're in over your head. You're not up to the job. So I'm going to ask you, Minister, can you tell Ontarians the cost of security for these games? And if you can't, Will you resign and give the job to somebody else who can start giving us those answers? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. <coughs> Minister. Speaker, security is paramount. We will, talk, we will not take any risks with the safety of our citizens. Here, here. Speaker, it is truly, truly unfortunate that the, op the member opposite cannot comprehend the fact that where we are in the planning stages now is completely normal. The security costs are continuously evolving as the game plan evolving. We have 10,000 athletes and coaches that will be visiting our province. We have 250,000 visitors that will be visiting our province. We have 14 host municipalities and multiple venues to coordinate and come to agreement with. Speaker, the game are uh, unprecedented event in our province. This is the largest game in 80 years ever hosted by Ontario. Right Speaker, the game is well planned and we are in the right track. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener Water. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My, my question is to the Minister of Labour. Yesterday, the Minister stood in this House and announced changes to workplace safety training, an online training module, and a mandatory poster. But I did not hear anything about training standards for fall prevention. Ministry of St Labour staff have already stated that training standards will not be ready until 2014, 2015. We know a standard for fall prevention training was ready in June 2011. I asked the minister three weeks ago why that standard is not already in place. Can the minister tell me when he will commit to making safety a priority Question. in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for, uh, for the question. And, and directly to her, safety is the number one priority of this government. As a result, Speaker, as you know and all members know, that we appointed uh, Tony Dean and an expert panel back in 2009 after the tragic accident. Uh, that took place, that took four workers' lives uh, in the uh, in city of Toronto. Uh, as a result, uh, Speaker, of, of uh, the expert panel, we have recommendations uh, to bring, bring about the biggest transformation uh, in health and safety in the province of Ontario in 30 years. And we are implementing one by one every single uh, recommendation uh, that was actually approved by this legislature unanimously. Uh, speaker for last couple of years and I was very proud yesterday to announce in this house that we are going to be introducing Answer. mandatory awareness training for all workers and supervisors and I thank all members for their support for that initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Mr. Speaker, years go by and this government consults. Years go by, workers die. It, since June, nine workers, nine workers have died from falling accidents in this province, including Christopher Birdsell in Hamilton, Kevin Raposo in Toronto, Nick Lalonde in Waterloo. The minister has the recommendations from the 2011 Dean report, which were wholeheartedly embraced by their government. Fall prevention training was a priority to be implemented in 12 months. The province, province's workers deserve more than posters. As we have seen in Newfoundland, mandatory training standards will save lives. When will pro fall prevention training become mandatory in, the, in Ontario? When? Thank you, Commissioner. Speaker, I really encourage the member opposite to perhaps read the Dean, uh, dean report, where she will see uh, that recommendations are, are made but requires a lot of extensive work in terms of exactly what those safety standards be. And we have been working extremely hard, Speaker, through our Chief Prevention Officer, which is first of its kind in all of Canada, in, in 
in consulting with labor, in consulting with businesses and municipalities to make sure that we have got the right kind of standards in place. There are already standards in place. We're looking at the, uh, for the enhancing them, Speaker. There is a draft standard out uh, for consultation as we speak, and very soon, Speaker, we'll be announcing uh, the implementation of those standards. Speaker, let me be absolutely clear. Uh, uh, clear. One life lost at a workplace is one too many, and we will continue to work extremely hard to make sure that every single worker in this province has not been forfeited with lives of our workers. Thank you, Speaker. Hey, hey. You see it, please? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 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 New question. Member from Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. I've got a question this morning for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, most of us take the simple act of breathing for granted, but every year more and more people across this province are being diagnosed with a horrible disease called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. It includes chronic bronchitis, it includes emphysema, and what it does is it slowly damages the sufferers' airways and makes it harder and harder for them to breathe. Unfortunately, to date, Speaker, there's no cure for this disease. Speaker, being that today is World COPD Day, I ask the minister through you, Speaker, what are we doing specifically to prevent more Ontarians <coughs> from contracting this deadly disease? Thank you, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Oakville for this question. Speaker, anyone who suffers from COPD or has a loved one who suffers from COPD mm. knows how horrible a disease this is. It takes a toll on a person's lungs but it also takes a toll on their life, Speaker. It can prevent people from participating in activities that uh, the, the rest of us take for granted, Speaker. It gets worse as you grow older, and it can lead to premature death. <coughs> Speaker, COBT, COPD is treatable, but it is not curable, Speaker, but it is preventable. And we know the best way to prevent COPD is by uh, stopping smoking. That's why our government has taken very strong action to toughen tobacco laws and encouraging Ontarians who do smoke to quit Answer. smoking, and better yet, not to take it up in the first place. Earlier this week, Speaker, I was pleased to introduce new legislation that, if passed, will go further to protect Ontarians from getting Thank you. COPD. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'm uh, pleased to see that we are taking that strong action that's necessary that's going to protect Ontarians from getting further COPD. Now, I know Ontario is a leader in Canada when it comes to controlling tobacco. Among other things, with the support of most members of this House anyway, we banned smoking indoors, in public places, and in closed spaces. We've also banned it in motor vehicles when children are present. The minister mentioned the new legislation she introduced earlier this week. Uh, through you, Speaker, would the minister please tell this House a little bit more, expand about this next step in the government's smoke-free Ontario strategy? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And I am pleased to say that our smoking rate is coming down, Speaker. Uh, we currently have the second lowest smoking rates in Canada, but that is not good enough, Speaker. We aspire to have the lowest smoking rates in Canada, and that means we have to make significant progress when it comes to smoking. So, as I said earlier, the best way to reduce those rates is to prevent people from starting in the beginning. Yeah. That's why our legislation would ban the sale of flavored tobacco products that make smoking more appealing to young people. It would double the fines for people who sell tobacco to kids. It would make them the toughest fines in the country. It would also protect Ontarians from secondhand smoke by prohibiting smoking in playgrounds and sports fields and in restaurant and patio, uh, restaurant and bar patio, Speaker. This Answer. is action that we are taking to save lives, Speaker, and I urge all members of this House to support that legislation. Thank you. New question. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources. Minister, you recently announced the closure of the MNR fire base in Pembroke. And I have to wonder how well that decision was thought out. Not well. well, the loss of jobs and the impact on local families will be devastating in of itself. You have significantly compromised our ability to fight forest fires with this decision. Sorry. As you know, response time is critical. Small fires spotted quickly can be dealt with quite easily. But once they get a full foothold, it can be disastrous. <laughs> Minister, I've met with senior members of the fire crews in Pembroke. Yes, they're worried about their jobs. 
but safety remains their paramount concern. Absolutely. I would ask that you would postpone this decision for one year until a thorough analysis of its effects can be done. And, Minister, not your analysis, a thorough analysis so we can understand the effects of this decision. Question. Will you do that, Minister? No. Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and I uh, appreciate the question. Uh, the member is uh, well aware that the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources is going through a modernization and transformation with respect to our fire operations. We'll continue to operate from 33 fire bases in the province of Ontario. Our top priority with respect to this program is to protect people, property, and our natural resources. The member is uh, aware I did speak to uh, the mayor, uh, Ed Jackano in Pembroke, as well as the mayor in Kirkland Lake, uh, Bill Inouye, as well as the uh, MPPs that were uh, uh, that uh, are affected by this in their uh, particular ridings and let them know with respect to the transformation uh, that this was happening. In the case of uh, Pembroke, the one full-time employee will be uh, relocated, uh, offered a relocation to uh, Halliburton and two full-time staff. The other two full-time staff will continue to be in place. The seasonal staff of approximately 20, of which there are six yes, in sir. Pembroke, will be offered uh, other opportunities uh, throughout the province, and we fully expect to have a similar complement, basically the same number of uh, fire staff uh, moving forward Thank in you. the next fire season. Supplementary. Minister, I heard you talk about this, how this will not affect safety. I vehemently disagree. I've heard you say this will save money. I don't believe it for a moment. The reallocations are actually going to cost more. You do not take into consideration all of the non-fire-related activities that fire crews provide for the citizens of that area and for the MNR, such as rebuilding of docks, brushing, assistance when spring floods occur. To add fuel to the fire, no pun intended, and I know Ed Jack and well, perhaps you should have talked to Tammy Stewart, the mayor of Head Claren Mariah, where they have no firefighting capabilities whatsoever. Oh. They border along our crown jewel of Algonquin Park, and they don't have a fire department. They rely on the MNR to provide their fire services. You're taking that away, and it's just telling them now that they're going to be supported Question. out of Halliburton. Please, Minister, this is a bad decision. It's going to come back to haunt you. Will you reconsider and postpone Thank this you. for one year till a proper analysis can be done? Thank you. You see any place? You see any place? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, Speaker. And you know, I say to the member, uh, our government has recently made an investment of $47 million in additional uh, support for three fire bases in Ontario, in Halliburton, in Sudbury, and in Armstrong, as well as for the first time, uh, flight simulation equipment that Ontario pilots will have in this province where they previously had to uh, leave Ontario. Our concern, obviously, is to be nimble and to be able to respond where these fires arise. We'll continue to have 33 bases in the province of Ontario. We will be able to respond in a timely way. We'll have virtually the same uh, complement of fire protection services staff out there uh, on the landscape, and uh, we're continuing to make investments. I remind the member as well that we were on a trajectory in this ministry to lose another $40 million in our budget, and I want to commend the Premier for putting $40 million back into the budget of MNR to support additional investments in this province. Thank you. No question. The member from uh, Algoma, Manitoba. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier this morning. Ontario Hydro has announced that it will cut off snowmobilers from using trails in hydro corridors unless they pay half of the property taxes on that land. Needless to say, snowmobile clubs do not have the funds to cover property taxes for hydro corridors. And there's now talk that the province wants to cash, the cash strap municipalities to cover the costs in an effort to download. When will this government stop passing the buck and come up with a real solution so that snowmobilers can use trails uninterrupted this winter season? This is not a matter of a cash grab. It's a matter of insurance and safety issues between uh, the Ministry of Infrastructure and the Ministry of Energy. It, the, the decision is under review right now uh, because of some of the concerns. This is an old piece of legislation. I will gladly follow up with a member. Thank you. Supplementary. Once again, to the Premier, during my constituency, during my constituency week, I met with the Espanola and District uh, Snowmobile Club and heard from many other snowmobile clubs in Algoma, Manitoulin, who are non-for-profit organizations that help bring tourism to the province and to their communities. 
This government has shut down trails and parks across Ontario, shut down tourist information stations, and restricted access to Crown land, and now wants to restrict winter recreational activities for Ontarians. This just isn't right. Will the Premier intervene and allow trails to stay open for snowmobilers in Ontario? Minister. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I said, this matter is under review. I will take it up with the member opposite once the review is complete. Thank you. New question, the member from uh, Plain Gary, Prescott Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources. The benefits that the forestry sector brings to Ontario's economy is of critical importance to many communities in Ontario. Speaker, I'm sure that you're aware, as many are in the House, the forestry industry has faced some challenges in recent years due in part to the crash of the U.S. housing market and the global economic downturn. Our government is working hard to strengthen Ontario's forestry industry and bring jobs in this sector back to northern Ontario. Speaker, the Ministry of Natural Resources made an announcement last week in Wawa about a new wood pellet production facility that will bring value-added jobs to the township as well as diversify the economy. Speaker, could the minister please explain how this new facility will benefit Northern Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Speaker, and appreciate the uh, question from the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell. This is an important question. And the forestry industry is seeing a resurgence. Our government is uh, wholeheartedly behind and doing everything we can to help uh, boost uh, jobs in the forestry sector. Last week, I was in Wawa, a company uh, called Rentec was uh, there as well, and they're investing in a plant in Wawa that has been idle uh, since about 2009. This is going to create 40 jobs, 100 construction jobs to reconfigure the plant, and 200 forestry jobs uh, in surrounding communities. It is an incredibly important investment for a community that has struggled in recent years and is another sign that the forestry industry uh, is rebounding. The uh, CEO of Rentec had this to say. We're grateful for the backing of Ontario and the Ministry of Natural Resources to support our investments. We're excited about bringing uh, safe, world-class businesses uh, to yes, regional jobs and economic opportunities to Ontario's local communities and First Nations. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I just want to reread a quote into the record, Mr. Speaker, because I, I missed a piece in the middle and it was garbled, and I just want to make sure. Uh, it's simple clear. correction of it is the a quote. Corre well, it is a correction because there was a chunk that I believe I missed. I haven't seen the answer, so I don't know, Mr. Speaker. But I then, off, then offer them what you believe is the chunk, please. Um, okay. I believe it was this sentence. I feel very optimistic that though it's not what we had before the program was cancelled, it definitely will sustain racing at Rideau and provide our patrons and the horsemen the critical mass that's required to maintain a program. I believe that's the piece that I missed. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I allowed that to happen because correcting the record is a point of order and it can only be correcting the record instead of requoting. Um, there are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.